Today I want to share with you the essential sugars for your prepper pantry and how each one is different and which ones are best for baking and cooking. Hi sweet friends! I'm Mary and welcome to Mary's Nest where I teach traditional cooking skills for making nutrient-dense foods like bone broth, ferment, sourdough, and more. So if you enjoy learning about those things, consider subscribing to my channel and don't forget to click on the little notification bell below that'll let you know every time I upload a new video. Well, many of you have shared with me in comments and emails that you get very confused when you go to the store and you see all the different types of sugars that are sold today. And so what I wanted to do was walk you through starting with white sugar and moving all the ways to the other end of the spectrum, finishing up with sucanat and explaining how each sugar is different and how it's best to be used in your baking and cooking. Now I just want to mention that if there's certain sugars you're interested in over others, check the pinned comment because I'll have timestamps associated with all of these. Now if you're at the very beginning of your journey from a processed foods kitchen to a traditional foods kitchen, all you might have in your kitchen and in your pantry right now is plain white sugar. And what you might have is just your typical pure cane sugar. It's just your granulated sugar that when we just use the generic term sugar, we think of this. Now, as I said, this is pure cane sugar or just white sugar. Sometimes you may see at your grocery store white sugar sold where it just says sugar and it doesn't say pure cane sugar. That's generally made from sugar beets, but it's also sugar. But people have different opinions on what type of white sugar they like to use. And many people prefer the pure cane sugar over the beet sugar or the sugar made from sugar beets because often sugar beets may be a genetically modified crop and there are people who uh, are troubled by that. So they'll always want to go with the pure cane sugar. So if you're trying to avoid GMO foods, then you'll want to look for pure cane sugar. Now, for the most part, as you're on your journey moving to a traditional foods kitchen, over time you want to phase out as much white sugar from your baking and cooking as possible. However, there are certain times when white sugar really does come in handy. For example, if you're baking, like say, an angel food cake or a, around Christmas time, sort of a white snowball cake. These things really do lend themselves best to just using white sugar. And since it may not be something that you're eating on a regular basis, I feel that it's okay to have some white sugar in your kitchen, in your pantry. Also, although I do share recipes for how to make jam without sugar, I do think that certain jams lend themselves very well to be ma being made with sugar. Now I tend to not use a lot of sugar. Most of the recipes that I share are for low sugar jams, but even so with those low sugar jams, I do feel white sugar works very well. So if you are a jam maker and at times there are certain jams you feel just lend themselves better to being made with white sugar, I think strawberry jam is one of them, then I recommend have some white sugar in your pantry. Because again, just like with special occasion cakes that you're not eating very often or jams that you're eating in very small amounts, uh, I, I'm, not, uh, I'm not a fanatic, I guess you could say, and I'm not gonna say you can't have any white sugar in your kitchen. I do think there are certain preparations, as I've shared, uh, where it does come in handy to have a little white sugar in your pantry. Now, when it comes to white sugar, in this case, pure cane sugar, there are varieties. And if you're wondering, HEB, yes, I live in Central Texas, and a lot of things I buy come from HEB, which is a wonderful grocery store that we have here uh, in Central Texas. Uh, so I am uh, using a lot of the HEB brands, but certainly any brand that you can find uh, where you live is, is uh, just as good. And none of this is sponsored. I buy all of these myself for my pantry. Uh, but I just, as I said, I think HEB is a great grocery store, and so that's where I shop. 
So now talking about white sugar variations, you're going to have powdered sugar, which is very common and very easy to find. Uh, you may also know this as confectioner's sugar or icing sugar. It's basically white sugar that's completely been completely pulverized into a nice powder so it blends beautifully, for, especially for making things like icing uh, for a cake or cupcakes, uh, hence the name icing sugar. Uh, it usually has a little bit of cornstarch added into it to keep it from clumping. Uh, however, uh, you know, as I said, I think there are certain preparations. Uh, if you, you know, just like if you're baking a white cake, uh, uh, specifically, I'm thinking uh, of the snowball cakes at Christmas time, where the cake is white, the frosting is white, and you put some coconut on it. Uh, I think that having a little powdered sugar in your pantry is a good idea to have on hand, uh, mostly, you know, for those special occasion cakes. Now, do you need to buy powdered sugar? Not necessarily. You can take your plain granulated sugar and whirl it in your blender and turn it into a powdered sugar. And one that if you're grinding just enough that you're going to use at that particular time for a particular recipe, you don't need to worry about adding in any, any little bit of cornstarch or arrowroot powder or things like that that would prevent it from clumping. And that way, if you're worried about any additives that are added to powdered sugar, you can just make your own homemade powdered sugar and not worry about having to buy powdered sugar se separately. Now, what about this little fella in the middle? This is called caster sugar. And caster sugar is basically between regular granulated sugar and powdered sugar. It's a very fine granulated sugar. And it can be used in baking. It can also be used for making uh, icing, uh, as it will dissolve very well. Uh, and but it will be all often commonly be seen as and served on the side when you're serving cold beverages that people may want to sweeten, such as iced tea, because if you put castor sugar in a cold beverage, it will, it will dissolve very quickly and very easily versus the uh, larger crystallized sugar that tends to just kind of sink to the bottom. Caster sugar is often used also when making meringues, you know, to top maybe like a lemon meringue pie or something like that, it, because it does blend very well and very easily. So you've got your regular plain sugar, just your regular crystallized sugar for general baking. What I would recommend, uh, you know, as I said, for maybe special occasion or holiday baking and jams, you've got your powdered sugar, which is very handy uh, when making icing. But again, you can always make your own powdered sugar by just blending, uh, pulverizing some of uh, your granulated sugar. And then your castor sugar is very nice for your cold beverages or making meringues. Now, can you make your own homemade castor sugar from your more traditional plain granulated sugar? Yes, but you're gonna have to be very careful because it's very easy to go from this to this powdered sugar very quickly. Uh, so you can do a little bit of experiment and see if you can get a very fine yet still granular sugar. So these are all made from sugarcane juice. And what they do is go through a process of, of boiling and drying and extracting and so on and so forth. You know, it kind of boggles the mind <laughs> what they go through to make sugar. But the bottom line is they're going to extract all of the molasses in order to get these sugars to be what we think of as white sugars. Now molasses is basically the byproduct of making white sugar because white sugars had all this molasses extracted out of it. But the wonderful thing about molasses is that it's very rich in vitamins and minerals and specifically it's rich in iron. As a child, my mother would often put a teaspoon of molasses in warm milk and give it to me to drink uh, to make sure that as a growing child I had enough iron. And molasses is wonderful to have on hand because it's great for baking, especially when you're making things like gingerbread or molasses cookies. It's also excellent in uh, making barbecue sauces. You can also add some to your dough when you're making rye bread and get that real nice dark rye that has a little touch of sweetness to it. Now molasses is also used 
to make what we call brown sugar. Now brown sugar comes in two varieties. It comes in light brown sugar and then it comes in dark brown sugar. And the difference is that the light brown sugar has less molasses in it and the dark brown sugar has more molasses in it. I believe the light brown sugar, they are adding in about 3% molasses and in the dark brown sugar, I think they're adding in about 6% molasses. But all they've done, the manufacturers, is taken white sugar and then they've added a white, white sugar and then they've added in some molasses. And depending on, as I said, the different percentages, how much molasses they add back into the white sugar, they make these brown sugars. Now you might be saying, good grief, why do they extract out all the molasses and then put some back in and then call it brown sugar? And the reason is manufacturers like to really control this so that when you buy light sugar, whether you buy this brand or another brand, that there's consistency so that when you have a recipe that calls for light brown sugar, you know that the brown sugar that you're using is appropriate. Just like you can make your own powdered sugar, you can make your own brown sugar. And I actually have a video where I show you how to do that, how to make a light brown sugar, dark brown sugar, and something that's a little more similar to sucanat, which is uh, just simply dried sugarcane juice, which we'll talk about in a minute. But all you do is take some of your granulated sugar, and I give you the proportions on how much molasses you have to add to make a light brown sugar, and then how much molasses you have to add to make a dark brown sugar. So again, there's a lot you can do with just buying your white granulated sugar and some molasses. Now this is just a plain unsulfured molasses. Uh, there's also something known as blackstrap molasses. And basically what the difference is, is that blackstrap molasses is gonna be your most nutrient rich molasses. And if you can find it, I recommend getting that. But don't worry if all you have is something like what I have here, it's still very nutritious. But if you ever do come across blackstrap molasses in your travels, definitely add it to your pantry. Now let's take a minute to talk about the shelf life of all of these. There are variations of opinion on this, but I'm gonna kinda go over the basics here with you. Uh, but also in the blog post that'll correspond to this video, I'll have some links for you that will take you to sites that talk about the shelf life of pretty much any food that you can think of. So you can read those different opinions and see who, uh, uh, which ones that you want to adhere to. Basically, a white sugar like this, a white granulated sugar, is basically indefinite in terms of its shelf life. It's considered what some will refer to as a forever food. You can store it in the original packaging like this, the way it comes from the store, uh, or in big packaging if you buy it in bulk at places like Costco, uh, or if you buy really large amounts of sugar, you can store it in the big food safe buckets, like the big five gallon buckets with the gamma lids. Um, but basically, it is considered a forever food. So that's nice to know. Now, powdered sugar and caster sugar. The more you do to something, even though yes, a lot has been done to this in terms of nutrients being extracted, but once you take something like a, gra a granulated sugar and you start doing things to it like pulverizing it, adding in a little cornstarch, whatever the case may be, different sites that talk about food storage will say that this has a shorter shelf life. Now, caster sugar, something like this that's still in its granulated form, even though it is uh, pulverized quite finely, uh, considered super fine, it's often referred to as super fine sugar. Uh, I personally think that that, like the more heavily granulated sugar, has an indefinite shelf life. And as far as powdered sugar is concerned, the only uh, real concern you're going to have is the clumping. Uh, yes, they often add a little something to uh, prevent clumping, 
but over time, is it more susceptible to moisture uh, and so on and so forth? And might it clump together a little more? That's always a possibility. But I have a video where I go over all the storage options for how to store all kinds of different foods in your prepper pantry. And I'll be sure to link to that uh, in the iCards along also earlier I mentioned how to make the brown sugar. I'll be sure to link to any videos I mention in the iCards and in the description below. You just open the description under this video. And I'll also put them in the pinned comment. And because I know for some of you that's a little easier to see. Uh, but if for any reason, in terms of the I cards, if I run out of room, yes, everything will be in the description under the video and in the pinned comment. Now, what about brown sugar? Brown sugar is recommended that if you buy it and it's in a sealed bag like this, that it's always best stored uh, in its original packaging. But what if you open it? Or what if you buy a 25 pound bag of light brown or dark brown sugar and you open it and you want to keep it in a food safe bucket or some other way of storing it? How do you keep it moist? That is going to be the biggest challenge because brown sugar, sugars in general, don't go bad but they can just change in their appearance and their quality. They can degrade. So how do you keep brown sugar from degrading? And what do we mean by degrading? Brown sugar can dry out and turn into something. And maybe this has happened to you. I know it's happened to me. It can turn into something that's as hard as a brick. So what you'll want to do once you open your brown sugar, you'll want to put in a piece of bread and the bread will have moisture in it and that will allow the brown sugar to absorb some of that moisture from the piece of bread and just check it periodically and when that bread is stale then just put in a new fresh piece of bread. But what if you don't want to use anything like that? What if you don't want to have to be worrying about using bread and then what are you going to do with that piece of bread? And if you're like me, you know, I don't like to waste. And, and so uh, what are some other options? And the nice thing is there are these little terracotta shapes that are sold. Uh, some people will just use a piece of terracotta flower pot, but you need to be very careful about that. You need to make sure it's food safe. But there are little food safe terracotta pieces. Sometimes they're shaped like little bears or something cute like that. And you'll basically just soak that in water, then dry it off, and then you'll plop that down into your powdered sugar because powdered sugar likes a moist environment. And so that little bear or whatever piece of terracotta that you use, food safe, of course, will help help keep your brown sugar moist. And keeping your brown sugar moist is really the point of extending its shelf life for as long as you can basically keep it moist. But what if it does turn into a brick? Is it done in for? Do you have to throw it out? No. Brown sugar can often be brought back to life. What you'll want to do is whatever vessel you've got it stored in and now it's in this form of a brick, you'll basically want to get something moist. You want to get maybe a piece of bread that you've put some water onto or a food safe cloth that you've wet and then wrung out and just put that on top of your uh, brown sugar and then seal it up real well and then check it the next day. Is it softened yet? Is it starting to soften? If not, just repeat the process, wring out your food safe cloth, and put it back into uh, your bucket or wherever, put the lid on or the plastic bag, however you're storing your brown sugar. And after a few days, it should soften up and be very usable and tasty again. And if you're like me and you use the flour sack towels to do things like straining uh, your bone broth or your kefir to make kefir cheese or yogurt cheese, things like that, those, food, those are food safe and those flour sack towels work very well for this process. You just wet it, wring it out real good, put it on top of your brown sugar, seal it up, and in a day or two, uh, just keeping that towel moist should soften up your sugar. So what about the shelf life of molasses? Can molasses go bad? Unopened, molasses in a container like this should have a shelf life for about 10 years. But once you open molasses, you do run the risk of over time, it 
developing potentially spots of mold. So you just need to be careful and keep an eye on that if you do have an opened bottle of molasses in your pantry. Now, if you have room to store it in your refrigerator, all the better. And being stored in the refrigerator, you're going to really extend its shelf life. Now, I just want to mention in talking about storing any of these sugars that we're going to talk about today in our pantry, when I use the term pantry, you may have often heard me refer to it as the four corners pantry. And when I say that, I'm talking about the working pantry, your everyday pantry that you access, as I said, every day. And then what's your refrigerator, what's in your refrigerator is another part of your pantry. A third part of your pantry is your freezer. And then the fourth part of your pantry is your extended pantry or your prepper pantry. And we've been talking a lot, especially this year, about what to store in our prepper pantry. And the prepper pantry serves many roles. It serves the role of being able to uh, re refill or restock, so to speak, our working pantry. Often in your extended pantry or your prepper pantry, you're going to be storing a lot of non-perishable goods, just like you would in your working pantry. And this way, when you run out of something, you check your extended pantry, and hopefully you have a few backups that you've accumulated over time, and then you can basically restock your working pantry. And then next time you're out shopping, you can buy what you need to restock your extended or prepper pantry. And so this way you keep things moving, you don't allow things to expire, and in the event of like what we went through this year, or unemployment, or bad weather, you know that you have some food to back you up to that you can make meals and provide for your family. And I have a whole series on how to stock the prepper pantry, what food should be in, in your prepper pantry based on what you like, how you can start stocking your prepper pantry on $5 a week, uh, it, I have a whole series of videos. I even have a 36 page free pantry list about all the traditional foods that you should be stocking your pantry with over time. Uh, and I'll be sure to link to that again in the iCards and in the description and the pinned comment below uh, so that you can definitely watch that series if this is something you're interested in learning more about. Now back behind me on my kitchen counter are what I think of as uh, all the sugars that are sort of on the continuum of sugars, starting uh, with the white uh, granulated sugar at the very beginning and ending with what I've got here, sucanat, which is just dried cane juice, sort of on the end with all of those somewhere in the middle. And I'll be bringing those over to my kitchen island in a minute and I'll go over each one. Uh, but I thought that I, you know, I started with the white sugar and I'm going to talk now about what's at the very end of, of the continuum continuum uh, basically in discussing sucanat. But also in addition to talking about all of the sugars, over here I've got a lot of other sweeteners that although are not sugarcane, are not derived from sugarcane, they are whole natural sweeteners that can be very handy to have in your traditional foods pantry. Uh, so I want to go over those as well. That's kind of some bonus uh, content. But in any event, what I want to do right now is just talk about sucanat. Sucanat is basically a very unprocessed form of sugarcane juice. And the nice thing about sucanat is that it is granulated and it's very easy to bake and cook with. Also, the nice thing about sucanat is that since it is the most unprocessed sugar and it's granulated, you can basically use this one for one if you're replacing white sugar in a recipe. Now, yes, the taste is richer. It is going to modify the taste a bit. It is going to modify the color of your final baked good a bit. But the nice thing is that it works very well in cookies, very well in muffins, very well in chocolate cake, brownies, anything like that. Really where I see white sugar, as I shared with you earlier, is more for those very specific special occasion cakes. For the most part, I use sucanat in pretty much all my baking. 
so basically, when did all of this develop? You know, what is, is Sukunet new on the scene? Uh, you probably, if you've been with me a while and, and you've, uh, you're a reader of the book uh, Nourishing Traditions by Sally Fallon, uh, you know that she was talking about Sukunet uh, 20 or so years ago. Uh, now, before that, I really wasn't very familiar with it. But in doing some research, I learned that Sukunet has actually been around since the 1970s. It was a Swiss inventor who figured out a process, uh, and I'm not a scientist, but I think it's some sort of centrifugal force type uh, invention that he created that allowed the ability to dry sugarcane juice and keep it in its 100% natural state while also crystallizing it, which in this crystallized form just makes it so versatile, as I said, for baking. And I'll also use it in cooking. If I'm making a tomato sauce and I want a little bit of sweetness in it, I'll just add my sucanat. I find the taste very pleasant. Yes, all of the molasses is intact, so it is going to have a stronger flavor than white sugar, but after using it for so many years, I don't find that to be an overly strong or unpleasant flavor. However, if you're very much at the beginning of your traditional foods journey, if you're leaving your processed foods kitchen behind, but you're at the beginning on your way to a traditional foods kitchen, uh, you may find the taste a bit strong. So don't feel bad if you want to start small with it. If you want to just replace maybe a quarter of the white sugar in one of your recipes. And then over time as your palate and your family's palate, your friend's palate, uh, 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 you know, gets used to the taste of a richer baked good, you can start incorporating more. The big thing is you take your time doing these things, because if you do this slowly, uh, you'll have success. You know, I often joke that I say that if you get the book Nourishing Traditions and then you announce to your family, okay, we're having liver tonight, because Sally does talk a lot about eating or the benefit of eating organ meats, everybody's gonna just raise their hands up and go, what, no, you know? So I think with any of this, as you're on your journey to your traditional foods kitchen, incorporate these things slowly. And buy a small bag, take it a little taste on the spoon, see what you think, substitute a quarter of the white sugar in a recipe with the sucanat, see if you notice a difference, see if you find it pleasant. I think you actually will. I find that it imparts a richer uh, flavor level to baked goods, especially chocolates, chocolate chip cookies, oatmeal cookies, brownies. I think it works beautifully. I think it also works great as uh, the type of sugar to sprinkle on top of uh, hot cereals like oatmeal. If you like putting brown sugar on oatmeal, you'll love putting sucanat on your oatmeal. So starting to add sucanat into your prepper pantry and your working pantry is a smart idea as you're uh, on this traditional foods journey. Now, how long does this last? Now I bought this the other day and this is December 2020 and this shows a best buy date of April 2024. But again, as I mentioned, there are differences of opinions on how long food is actually good for. And this is why you're seeing more and more on foods simply best buy date as opposed to expiration date. So this is recommended that it's going to be best through 2024, mid 20, April 2024. However, uh, not unlike your granulated sugar, Sucanat actually can have a very long shelf life. Now, yes, it has the molasses intact, but unlike the brown sugars, where they're adding the molasses back in and it's kind of a wet, clumpy, wet, sandy type of sugar, this, because of that interesting process in terms of how it's made and being granulated, you're going to find that it's more similar to the you know, typical sugar and it's going to stay nicely granulated and in good working condition, so to speak, for longer than your brown sugars. But what if you decide that you wanna put some of this away 
in your prepper pantry for long-term storage and it does get hardened, you can just use the same technique you use with your brown sugar to help soften it up. But I think you're going to find that this is going to stay granulated for quite a long time. Now, Sukhanat, the name Sukhanat, stands for sugarcane natural. Basically what they've done is taken the first few letters of sugar, the first few letters of cane, and then the first few letters of natural, and you come up with Sukhanat, sugarcane natural. And this name is trademarked, and it's generally uh, the, the sugar cane that they use to make Sukhanat, I believe, generally comes from Costa Rica. You may see other products that are basically like Sukhanat, but are labeled uh, differently. You may see something sold simply as dried sugar cane juice, and then that would simply be dried sugar cane juice, very similar to exactly what Sukhanat is. Uh, you may see it sold under the name Rapadura, that is also dried sugar cane juice. Uh, the only difference is they're different companies and they have different names for their product. And I believe Rapadura is made with sugar cane uh, that comes from Brazil. Uh, I, I believe that that's correct. So there are different names for basically the same thing. So you're gonna, if you want dried sugar cane juice, and because of the nutritional profile, it's still got all the molasses in it, but it's just because it's very unprocessed. It's not where you've taken white sugar and added molasses back in. This never had the molasses extracted out, and it's done in a way that is supposed to keep the nutrients very intact and so on and so forth. So this can be considered very nutritious. Now, yes, it's still a sugar you don't want to overdo, but the nice thing is it does have all the vitamins and minerals intact. So if you want a very unprocessed sugar that has all the vitamins and minerals, as I said, intact, you want to look for Sucanat or Rapadura or simply something that says dried sugar cane juice. So we've covered the very beginning of the sugar continuum and we've gone to the very end of the sugar continuum. You've got your white sugar on one end, you've got your sucanat on the other. Now, what's in the middle? Well, after white sugar, the next sugar that is less processed than white sugar are sugars like this that you may see called raw sugar or turbinado or demerara. Basically with these sugars, what you'll find is that they have a very large crystal to them. And you may have often seen these used to sprinkle maybe on top of a cupcake or on top of a muffin where you see some uh, a light brown colored but large granulated sugar that's not moist or anything like your brown sugar, that's actually individual granules and that have a crunch to them. Often you may see sugar in the raw or sometimes turbinado uh, sold in little packages. And you may also see this at restaurants and people will put this in their coffee or in their tea. It, these sugars are less processed than white sugar, but they don't have all the molasses in them. Some of the molasses has been removed and, and the way that they're processed is also in sort of a drying centrifugal force type uh, processing that allows this granulation to be in place yet to have some of the molasses also still in place. And that's why they have this light brown color. And generally for these, the way that I like to use them is to top baked goods where I want a little crunch or to add to coffee or tea where I want something that gives a little bit of a richer flavor than sweetening those hot beverages with white sugar would. Now, if you're at the beginning of your journey from a processed foods kitchen to a traditional foods kitchen, these can be very good to start incorporating into your pantry. Now, I generally don't recommend them for baking, but in a pinch, you could always pulverize them, and then you would have something more along the lines of a powdered sugar. Uh, if you have a recipe that calls for powdered sugar and you want to use something that has a little more molasses and a little more nutrition in it, you could certainly do that. But primarily, I think these are very good for topping baked goods for crunch, for using in a hot beverage, 
and topping hot cereal with. If you like brown sugar on your oatmeal, as I said, sucanat can be very nice when you get to the point that you like the taste of sucanat. These can be a very good place to start too. These sprinkled on oatmeal are very nice. Not only do they give the sweetness and a little bit of that rich sweetness flavor because they do contain some molasses, they also give a nice little crunch. So if you're baking something and you don't really feel like doing a crumb topping and going into that level of, of work, you can just sprinkle some demerara or some turbinado or sugar in the raw right on top and you have a nice little basically mock crumb topping that gives some crunch to your muffin or other baked good. Now these are made in slightly different ways, but it's really not crucial to know all of these differences. Uh, you know, as I said, demerara in order to get the crystallization is processed like in a centrifugal kind of drying force. Turbinado, I believe, is like the first pressing of the cane juice. And I think sugar in the raw in many ways is similar to turbinado. Uh, they basically all look very similar. Sometimes turbinado is a little finer and sugar in the raw is a little bit finer than your demerara, which has often got a very uh, large crystal to it. Uh, but overall, they're similar in taste and they're similar in their nutritional profile. You may just notice some slight difference in their level of granulation. And like your white granulated sugar and your granulated sucanat, your demerara, your turbinado, and your sugar in the raw also have a fairly long shelf life because they are granulated. They're drier. And the, and the drier the sugar, the less inclined it is to become hard like your brown sugars. So these do store very well in your prepper or your extended pantry as well as your working pantry. And just to give you an example, I bought this turbinado sugar the other day, and as I said, we're in December of 2020, and this has a best buy date of November 2024. Uh, and again, that's best buy. Chances are, if you buy this turbinado and store it as is in your extended pantry, it will last well, well beyond 2024. And speaking of your extended pantry, uh, I discuss this in more detail in my Prepper Pantry series videos, but as I said, your extended pantry or your Prepper Pantry is where you keep your backup supplies so that you can restock your working pantry, especially if you're in a situation where you can't get to the grocery store and the extended pantry keeps you from running out of food. You can also designate an area of your Prepper Pantry or your extended pantry to be what we call sometimes the survival pantry. And that's really where you store your forever foods in the event that there was ever some type of very severe emergency. But the nice thing about that is you don't need to buy any fancy foods. You don't need to buy, a, what are they, freeze dried foods or things like that. There are a lot of foods that are classified as forever foods that will last, you know, often 25 years or more that you can put in that little area of your uh, prepper pantry that you de designate, okay, those are foods I'm not going to touch. I'm just going to keep those separate in my survival area in the event that there are very hard times. And uh, I'll be sure to link to the video where I discuss those forever foods. And I think that you'll really find that very interesting. When I was researching, I found it fascinating uh, the amount and number of foods that, can, that by the U.S. Department of Agriculture, I live here in the United States, that the U.S. Department of Agriculture says basically do last forever. And I found that, I found it quite interesting and I think you'll enjoy that video if that is something that uh, if there's a set part of your prepper or extended pantry that you do want to designate for very long-term storage. The next sugar I want to talk about is muscovado. Now the muscovado that I have here is dark muscovado. It also comes in light muscovado. Now that may sound familiar to you because we talked about light brown sugar and dark brown sugar. The same is true of muscovado. There's dark and light. 
And technically, this is really your true brown sugars because muscovado is very unprocessed. Basically, when they make dark muscovado, they're extracting very little of the molasses that occurs naturally in the sugarcane juice. And when they make the light muscovado, they extract a little more molasses. So basically what they're doing when they make the muscovado is they're extracting some of the molasses. Unlike what we know as light and dark brown sugars, they're not starting with white sugar and adding molasses back in, they're starting with the, the sugarcane juice and they're boiling it and preparing it in a certain way and just taking out some of the molasses. So it's much less processed than what we know as brown sugar. Now generally muscovado is sold in these smaller packages at least where I live and it's considered a little bit more of a gourmet item uh, because it is such a uh, unrefined product and it uh, you may also see it labeled sometimes you may know it as barbado sugar uh, but in the area where i live it's referred to as muscovado sugar and it comes from different places around the world uh, but it's a very nice sugar and it's a, because it's a very natural brown sugar and it's very rich in vitamins and minerals and it works really great in baking it works great for gingerbread molasses cookies chocolate cakes uh, brownies, all of your darker baked goods. Muscovado blends beautifully, uh, adds a wonderful sweet sort of rich flavor that complements itself very well with those highly spiced or chocolate baked goods. So if you have a recipe that calls for light brown sugar or dark brown sugar and you want to use something that's less processed then what we think of when we think of those light and dark brown sugars, you can use dark muscovado or light muscovado. And in addition to baking, it really works in the same way that you would use brown sugar. It's great for sprinkling on oatmeal. It's great for uh, mixing in and when you're doing like a cooked barbecue sauce and uh, putting in some of this if you're not using molasses and you want to use a brown sugar a dark muscovado or a light muscovado is fantastic. The flavor profile, in addition to it being uh, very nutrient rich, I find the flavor profile is deeper than the more processed brown sugars. Uh, I, I, it may take a, get a little getting used to if you're at the very beginning of your traditional foods journey. You may find uh, if molasses is not something that you've used a lot in your kitchen uh, you may want to start slow with muscovado uh, because i do feel that the flavor profile is richer and deeper uh, something that i like but again you know it's something that your palate may need to adjust to over time but i do find that the flavor palette is richer and deeper than your uh, more highly processed brown sugars now what about shelf life the muscovado in many ways reacts very similar to your brown sugars. It is a very moist sugar and it can uh, harden into a brick just like brown sugars can over time once they're open and exposed to air. So you want to try to store this in its original packaging and eventually if you do open it you want to store it in a moist way the same way we talked about how to store brown sugar and then if you find yourself in a situation where your muscovado is as hard as a brick again you can reconstitute it basically in the same way you would uh, uh, refresh uh, the brown sugar that we talked about earlier now, I don't know if you see these a lot at your grocery store, but I live in, as I've shared with you, in Central Texas, and so we border with Mexico, and we have a lot of Mexican foods here. There's a lot of like Tex-Mex restaurants and, and all of that. And so we have a lot of uh, Mexican specialty foods in our grocery stores. And this is one that is very common. And it'll be in the sugar section. Sometimes it'll be in the baking section. And it looks just like this. There's a little cone. And uh, it's got the name on it, Panela. Now, it also has above that, and excuse me if I butcher this pronunciation, but I believe it's Pilincilo. 
and this is wonderful. This is basically a sugar cane juice uh, that's grown in Mexico and they simply boil it. Uh, I believe that's how it's processed and they pour it into a mold and that's why it looks in this shape. And this is very rich in nutrients. This in many ways, and we'll talk about this fellow over here in a minute, but these two in many ways are very related to Sucanat. They're both basically dried sugarcane juice. The only difference is how they're processed and how their process can affect you know, the nutritional profile a little, number one, and number two, how they're processed is also affecting their consistency and their ease or lack of ease in terms of use. You know, as I said, Sucanet being uh, processed in the way in the, with the equipment that was developed in the 1970s makes this a very nice granulated product that's very easy to use. Uh, the Panella, now the pilincillo <laughs> uh, needs to be grated or chopped with a knife. But once you grate this up or chop this with a knife, it can be used very similarly to how you would use sucanat, to how you would use your brown sugars. It's very tasty. Uh, I have a friend who will often grate this up and make a hot chocolate drink, uh, a Mexican hot chocolate, and that's got a little spice to it. And she'll grate this and use this in it, and it's quite lovely. Now this is another uh, dried sugar cane juice that you might see as well in your store. Uh, or uh, this, if it's not very common in your area, uh, you may have to get this online if this was something that you would be interested in. This is common, commonly comes from India. And again, I hope I pronounce it correctly. I believe it's pronounced jaggery. And this is also made, again, from unrefined cane juice. And they do a very similar process uh, to the Mexican panela. They, uh, I believe, boil it and pour it into molds and uh, then grate it or chop it when they want to use some type of, uh, use it in some type of baking or cooking or however they want to use it. Now, this jaggery is made from dried sugarcane juice. I know that sometimes people have told me uh, in comments when we've talked about sugars in the past or in emails that jaggery sometimes can be made from the sap, I don't know if sap is the right word, but of uh, a palm tree or uh, different sources like that. Uh, I have not personally seen that. The jaggery that I have always seen does always say unrefined evaporated sugar cane juice. So if that's important to you to make sure that what you're using is a form of dried sugar cane juice, you wanna make sure that your jaggery does list that. But like this pilincillo, <laughs> I like saying that, it, uh, it's very tasty, jaggery is very tasty, and if you spend some time researching online, I always find it very interesting because the Indian cuisine often talks about the nutritional uh, benefits of their cooking, uh, like with turmeric, and how that is very much an anti-inflammatory, and that is in many of their dishes, and you might hear about turmeric tea, and you'll sometimes see uh, discussions online about uh, sweetening your turmeric tea using jaggery. And they'll talk about the nutritional profile of jaggery and the benefits that they believe that it brings to uh, the human body. And I, I just find that fascinating. But like any unprocessed sugar, it is going to be rich in vitamins and minerals with all of that molasses in place. But again, yes, these are sugars and they do you know, affect your body uh, in ways that sweeteners do. And so you just wanna keep that in mind. I don't recommend using any of these in excess. Uh, I recommend using them in small amounts. But I think a little jaggery in a turmeric tea would be delightful. I think some of the panela in a, uh, a hot cocoa or hot chocolate uh, would be wonderful. Now, 
shelf life. <laughs> basically, in my book, I think these are basically forever foods because they're already hard as rocks. This is very hard and this is very hard. And so there's no uh, fear of it turning hard or turning uh, um, into something that's not very useful. I think that stored in their original packaging and or after you open them, just sealed very well. Uh, hopefully their uh, nutritional profile will st stay intact for a good long while and be some nice handy sweeteners for you uh, that you can grate or chop up. And you know, I think like all of these sugars that we're talking about, where many of them, yes, may have very long extended shelf lives, will they be as nutritious as the day you bought them if you opened them 25 years from now? No they do degrade in terms of over time in some of their nutritional profile. And I have more information on that if you, you know, watch that video and you see the links that I share uh, in the Forever Foods video. But overall, often the decrease in the nutritional profile isn't incredibly significant. There's some decreasing in nutrition, but much of the nutrition of these more molasses based sugars does stay in place. So it can be something that's wonderful both for your everyday working pantry or your extended and or prepper pantry. Now, might you find other sugars with different names that are on the continuum from white sugar all the way to sucanat? Yes, but what you need to know is that basically they're somewhere on that continuum. They're just basically going to be uh, a little less or a little more processed than white sugar or sucanat. But they're basically gonna be somewhere in the middle. And over time, the more you can move to using sugars that are less processed and have more molasses in them, the better. Now, what I wanna go over here is sort of a little bonus information. These are technically not sugars. They're not made from sugarcane juice. They are made, uh, they're just made from various things, but they are natural whole sweeteners. First, what I've got over here is coconut sugar. I like coconut sugar. I find in many ways it's very similar in its taste profile to sucanat although you really do need to buy small amounts of these and taste them on a spoon and see what you think. Because some people feel, I don't really taste coconut from these sweeteners, uh, but they do have a rich taste profile. Not necessarily molassesy, <laughs> molassesy, that's the word, uh, like a sucanat uh, or a muscovado or some of these others that we've talked about here today, but it does have a richer flavor profile. And, but because it's more or less granulated, I find it stores very well, and I find that it works very well in baking for basically a one-to-one -one substitute in recipes that may call uh, for white sugar or light brown sugar or dark brown sugar. I don't get too fussy, you know, with recipes. Uh, if I just wanna make something and I wanna use a whole sweetener, I'll just take it no matter what it says, and it usually comes out okay if it's white sugar I'm replacing or light brown sugar or dark brown sugar. If I'm replacing it with one of these whole sweeteners, it usually works out just fine. And I find that coconut sugar does work quite well in baking. And it's also something that, again, you can sprinkle this on... Um, uh, your cereal, you know, if you eat hot cereal like oatmeal, I think it can work very well in place of brown sugar. In terms of beverages, this is where I have found people tell me that they do notice a distinct flavor if they try to use this in making hot cocoa or hot chocolate or putting it in their tea or putting it in their coffee. They find that they're not a fan of the flavor profile, but it's not as distinct if you're just mixing it in with some hot cereal or you're using it in baking. So these are good places to experiment. 
also in cooking I have although I think my Italian mother would say what the heck are you doing <laughs> I have put some a little pinch in tomato sauce to sometimes reduce the acidity uh, I've also uh, used this in barbecue sauces so it has a lot of uses now something that I want to clarify because this can be very confusing to folks if you notice this says uh, coconut sugar and this is the wholesome brand that also makes sucanet wholesome and I think they made the molasses as well they make a lot of natural sweeteners this says coconut palm sugar these are exactly the same thing what can be confusing is there's also something called palm sugar and that's made from a different type of palm, not the coconut palm. And it does, it's made a little differently and it has a little different nutritional profile. Um, but it's not something that I buy. It's not something I can even easily find. These I can pretty much easily find at my grocery store. I'm amazed at the selection of sweeteners that not just my grocery store, but other grocery stores I've been to uh, carry because I think many people are on this journey to a traditional foods kitchen and they're trying to incorporate more whole sweeteners into their, uh, into their diets, you know, into their cooking. And speaking of whole sweeteners, today we're talking about sugar and other whole sweeteners. These all have calories associated with them. I do have a video where I discuss all of the low-cal, no-cal, keto, friendly, whatever, sugar, sugar substitutes like your stevia, erythritol, monk fruit. I have a video where I go over all of those and what exactly their pr flavor profiles are like and where you can use them and so on and so forth. And it's actually in the middle of a video where I'm showing you how to make a keto coffee creamer, a homemade uh, powdered keto coffee creamer. But I will put the link to that in the description and, and in the pinned comment below. And I'll put the timestamp as to where I have this discussion about all of these locale and no cal sweeteners if that's something that you're interested in learning more about i found it fascinating uh, i use some of them but not all of them and i found it fascinating researching them and learning uh, what was keto friendly what was not and what's low carb and all of these different things and the effect on the body and so but i will put a time stamp uh, it, as to where in that video is that discussion so you can watch that separate from the overall video if, if uh, making a keto coffee creamer is not something that you're interested in doing, which I understand. But uh, in any event, so if you're looking for coconut sugar, it may say coconut sugar or it may say coconut palm sugar, but just palm sugar is something different. So just be alerted to that. Uh, but as I said, I find coconut sugar very versatile. Next, what I want to talk about is honey. I like honey because honey is very easy to find. Uh, this is a local honey. There's a town called Round Rock that's uh, uh, north of Austin, Texas. I live in the hill country between Austin and San Antonio, but this is a local uh, honey company in uh, Round Rock and they make wonderful honey as you can see this is just a delightful dark and pourable honey which makes uh, I like whoops I like honeys that are also uh, very dense as well uh, but I do like to keep pourable honeys on hand because these are very useful when baking and if you want to replace any of these sugars or whole sweeteners with a liquid sweetener like a honey and we'll talk about these other ones in a minute uh, basically you're going to use less than you would of your uh, dry uh, ingredients so and sometimes you need to adjust your liquid but generally a rule of thumb is three about three quarters of a cup of honey can replace one cup of a whole a whole uh, sugar or dried sugar or dried whole sweetener but as I said pourable honeys are great to keep on hand because they are easy 
for baking. Uh, you can also use them in your cooking. They are great in barbecue sauces, baked beans. Uh, that's something that I mentioned with some any of these that have the molasses in them are wonderful uh, sugars to use in baked beans. Uh, and again, you know, of course, for tea, you can never go wrong with some honey. Now, honey, it can also be found in something, and I'm not sure if it's called honey powder or dried honey, something like that, where they've actually uh, dehydrated, I gather, uh, honey, liquid honey. Uh, but I think it's very expensive and I think it's hard to find. So it's generally not something that I would recommend using, but if it's something that you're interested in, uh, know that it, it is available. Now, two other liquid sweeteners that I wanna talk about are date sugar and maple syrup. And both of these are available in dried forms and they are a little easier to find. Now, date syrup in many ways is very similar to molasses. It's very dark, it's got a very rich flavor. And if this is something that you want to incorporate into your kitchen because of its nutritional profile, it is very nutritious just like dates are, uh, this is a very good option. Uh, again, though, you know, it's going to have that very rich flavor, not unlike a molasses. And so you would use it in a similar way with your gingerbreads, your molasses cookies, or I should say mock molasses cookies, uh, your chocolate cakes, your brownies. Uh, it can work very well in place of molasses. Uh, now, they also make date sugar. And this is a nice granulated, also it's very easy to work with. And it's got a nice flavor to it if you like dates. You know, this is something you need to keep in mind. I'm not saying you need to have every single one of these in your pantry. Uh, it's really gonna be a matter of what type of whole sweeteners that are nutritious, you know, that have a nice nutritious profile that you want to incorporate into your pantry because you like them and you like their flavors. Uh, but I find date sugars, I like dates, and I find date sugar very pleasant. And is it funny, it even says on the front, pleasant tasting natural sweetener, raw and unprocessed. Excellent for use in baked goods. And I would agree. Uh, this can easily replace brown sugar wherever a recipe calls for it. Or if you didn't have sucanat and you'd rather use uh, dates in place of uh, sucanat, you can use that. You could use it in place of coconut sugar. It works very well in baked goods. And even your lighter colored baked goods, you know, like if you're making banana muffins or apple muffins or anything like that, uh, I think that it's relatively light in color. It's a little lighter in color than coconut sugar and it can work uh, even if you're doing a yellow cake. Uh, we'll talk about maple sugar in a minute uh, for a yellow cake, but I think date sugar can work as well. And as, and as the package says, and as I agree, it does have a, 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 I think a pleasant, relatively mild flavor compared to the date syrup, which I think is quite a bit stronger. Now, like honey, maple syrup can be used in baking. And in many places where uh, you might use a touch of molasses, but you want something lighter in flavor, or you like the maple flavor, and you wanna add it to baked beans or barbecue sauce, uh, or you're doing a baked good uh, where you don't mind that there might be a little bit of that molasses flavor. Uh, again, it's similar to honey in that you would use maybe about three quarters of a cup in place of any of your dried whole sweeteners. But this can work, I think, very well in baking and very well in cooking. Now, not unlike the date syrup and date sugar, you can also buy, I don't have this, uh, I bought some maple sugar, but I keep it in a container in my pantry, so I don't have the actual container that it came in. But I do keep some maple sugar on hand, and this is a very nice, light, crystallized product. And we'll talk about the shelf life on all of this in a minute, but I like maple sugar very much. If I'm looking to bake something that I want a lighter color. 
and I don't mind a little infusion of the maple flavor. And I find that maple sugar can work well when making a yellow cake. And depending on what other flavorings you're adding in terms of the icing and whatnot, I don't feel that the maple flavor that comes through is really strong. You may not even notice it. I highly recommend experimenting with it, but I really do reserve maple sugar for those times that I want to bake something that I want to retain a lighter color. And the reason is that I do keep this really just for almost those special occasion baked items is because maple sugar can be costly. And as I've shared with you, you know, I think it's very important when it comes to buying any of these, buy what's in your budget. And then as you're making your journey uh, to your traditional foods kitchen and you start buying less processed foods and you start eating out less and you can uh, move monies around that can be more devoted to your grocery budget and then you can buy foods that maybe originally didn't fit into your grocery budget, that's great. But always stay within your grocery budget because I always say stress is the worst thing for our diets. So <laughs> I don't think that uh, you want to buy things that are too expensive. And I do feel maple sugar is costly, so I really do reserve this for uh, sort of my special occasion baking. Uh, now, talking about maple syrup, maple syrup used to be described as grade A or grade B. And grade A was a little lighter and grade B was a little darker. And actually grade B, uh, according to Sally Fallon in Nourishing Traditions, uh, is considered to be more nutritious than the grade A. Uh, so I would always, and it was less expensive, which was nice. And so I would always buy the grade B maple syrup. Now, the labeling, it's my understanding that the labeling of maple syrup has changed. So what you may see now is everything labeled grade A, but there may be the, the dis, uh, distinction of grade A amber or grade A dark. And if you're uh, incorporating maple syrup into your diet and you like the taste of maple syrup, I would recommend buying that grade A dark, because I do believe that has more nutrition. Now, shelf life. Basically, a lot of these can last a very long time, not unlike some of the others that we talked about. Uh, now, uh, some of the other sugars that we talked about and how they have very long shelf lives. Now, a lot has to do with has it been opened or has it not been opened. Date syrup, if it's not opened, can have a very long shelf life, not unlike molasses that hasn't been opened. If you do open it and you can, and you have room in your refrigerator and you can refrigerate it, that's great. Uh, if not, it can stay at room temperature. You just, as I said with the, with the uh, molasses, you just want to keep an eye on it and make sure that it's not degrading, make sure that no mold has developed in it. The same is true of maple syrup. Unopened maple syrup can last a very long time. Once opened, it is recommended that you refrigerate maple syrup. Now, unlike date syrup, once you open this, you don't have to refrigerate it. As a matter of fact, on the packaging, it says, you know, refrigeration not necessary. However, I'm just recommending that if you do open it and you have space in your refrigerator, you may be able to prolong its shelf life by having it refrigerated. However, when it comes to maple syrup, once you open it, it is recommended to refrigerate it because you can develop uh, mold or other problems in terms of spoilage quicker than you can with other items that are opened and not immediately refrigerated. Now, when it comes to honey, Honey is one of those forever foods. You can open it, you can leave it at room temperature, you don't need to worry about it. Honey, we're told, should last forever. Uh, it may crystallize on you and you can always put it down if it's in a liquid form like this and you can still consume it like that if you want or you can put it in a little hot water, uh, the container, and let it soften up uh, or loosen up and come back to its liquid form. But basically honey is just a wonder food. <laughs> 
<laughs> you can basically have it forever. Now date sugar, because it is in the crystallized form, does uh, hold up very well like any of your crystallized sugars. Um, it does have a little moisture in the, in the sense that it's simply uh, made from dates and no, no other ingredients. So it's just basically dried dates and in, in made into a, a sugar form. And so you might get a little bit of clumping, um, but, and if for any reason it turned hard on you, uh, you could simply use the same methods that we use for softening up uh, brown sugar and the muscovado, other, other sugars that can have somewhat of a sandy consistency and potentially harden. Uh, although uh, in, kept in its original packaging, it does stay uh, quite fresh for a long time. So that's something to keep in mind. And the same with maple sugar, uh, thanks to this very granulated form that it's sold in, also has a very long extended shelf life and is very unlikely to uh, you know, turn clumpy or into any kind of brick. If, stored, if you want to store it for the long term and you store it in the original packaging that it comes in, it'll last a very long time and you shouldn't have any trouble with it. Now these two coconut sugars I also bought recently and as I said, uh, just to repeat, we are in December 2020 and this has a Best Buy date of June 2023 and this one has a Best Buy date of July 2023. Uh, and again, you know, these are very granulated, you can hear that, and uh, stored in their original packaging, they're going to last a very long time. Uh, if once opened, you do want to keep them, you know, sealed tightly uh, to try to keep as much uh, moisture and air away from them. Uh, but most likely, they're going to hold up very well, like any of these sugars that are in this granulated form. The granulation of however it's processed really helps extend the shelf life. If you'd like more information on how to stock your prepper pantry, be sure to click on this video over here where I've got a playlist of my whole prepper pantry series, including information where you can download that 36 page pantry list, which is totally free. And I'll see you over there in my Texas Hill Country kitchen. Love and God bless.